this episode, Andy and Luke discuss the George the Animal Steel horror extravaganza, Ed Wood. Welcome to The Road Home on Film. Welcome back, folks, to The Road Home on Film. My name's Andy, coming to you live to tape as usual. And today, we're welcoming back LSJ, Luke from Australia. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? <laughs> I'm well, man. I mean, today was a weird day, but we're not going to get into any of that. doesn't matter. You know, we're right in the middle of some kind of craziness uh, going on in the world. But you tell you, I tell you what, I was really looking forward to this because we're going to talk about an awesome movie tonight um, and one that... Again, like I said, I was looking forward to it to kind of take me away from all of my problems to think about this amazing movie. Uh, Luke, what movie are we covering today? We're covering the movie Ed Wood from uh, around 1994, the uh, the Tim Burton kind of love letter slash biopic of the uh, late not-so-great director. Now, why are we covering it for a road home for a wrestling podcast? Why, why are we doing that? Because the we got uh, there's a I think a, a character uh, an actor that Ed Wood used to use in a lot of his films named Tor Johnson, and that's played by uh, George the Animal Steel in uh, in the movie. It's true, and that Tor Johnson guy actually was a wrestler. So we have a wrestler playing a wrestler in this movie, which is pretty neat. Um, how do you feel about Tim Burton's movies in general? This, this is one of the good ones, you know, things have kind of changed for him over the years. How, how do you feel about his movies? My wife explained, uh, I told my wife what I thought of his career and he's like, and she's like, oh, that's kind of how I feel about David Lynch's career. Uh, so I like, I like quite a few of his flicks. I like, uh, Beetlejuice I'm, uh, as a comic book nerd. I love his Batman movies. He did. Uh, I didn't even know he directed this, but I have fond memories watching Pee Wee's Big Adventure and uh, and Mars Attacks, which is the movie he did uh, after Ed Wood. Uh, after that, like once we get to Planet of the Apes and Beyond, um, where we have a bit of a rocky relationship, I think because uh, I think he maybe he's got his head up. He's he's bought a bit, but. I don't know. Uh, I'm more a fan of his, say, Mars Attacks and before than I am with uh, much of his work that he did after. Yeah, Pee-wee's Big Adventure is the first movie I saw that was a Tim Burton movie. And by the way, if you're out here listening to this, this that movie holds up. It's still fucking hilarious. I mean, it was funny when I was a kid. It's funny now. It's forever funny. That movie is awesome. And uh, I was really a big fan of that. I loved Edward Scissorhands. I loved this movie. I watched this movie probably when I was 16, I think, maybe in like 96, a couple years after it came out. And uh, I fell in love with this movie. And, you know, this is good Tim Burton. You know, this is when he's using his style to benefit the story as opposed to who cares about the story, this is 100% style, and that's kind of what you see nowadays when you see a Tim Burton movie. Um, it's like his weird hair and weird characteristics have taken over the whole movie, you know, and yeah. uh, it's it's just not good anymore. But, um, but this movie is directed by Tim Burton. It's one of his earlier films, and, um, you know, we could talk real quick about some of the actors and see how you thought they did. You know, first off, we got to talk about George the animal steel um he was brought into the wwwf by bruno san martino uh who he worked really well with and then you know he just was a staple that stuck around into the wwf and wrestled for years and years and uh, he just passed away recently if i remember correctly and um it's a shame he was great a great character but luke you don't have a lot of experience with uh george the animal steel as a wrestler do you i don't so uh, i got into wrestling say around 97 and so I, I miss a lot of I know who a lot of these 80s guys are uh, and uh, I know them by sight as well if I see them but uh, if you were to tell me any major matches or feuds that uh, George still had I've got zero memory of them I've, I've not seen any of that stuff 
I have a weird George the Animal Steel story. Um, so years ago, uh, Matt Taven was on a show. And he was actually being – like his opponent was managed by George the Animal Steel. And his opponent was wearing very similar clothing to An- uh, George the Animal Steel. And uh, Matt Taven accidentally moonsaulted onto the very old uh, George the Animal Steel who had a colostomy bag which just went all over the floor. And it was extremely <laughs> embarrassing and terrible. So I knew that story. Um, and once years ago – this is back in – 20- bad for laughing. <laughs> Yes, it was like in like 2014 or something like that. I was at an ROH show and Matt Taven came out and he got up in my face. I was like right in the entrance. He got up in my face and I said, I know what you did to George the Animal Steel. And he looked at me and he just stared daggers into my eyes. And he fucked with me a couple more times the rest of that night. He wasn't real happy with me. (laughs) Good times. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, okay, so how do you think he did in this movie? I thought he was great, right? I thought he was fantastic, yeah. Do my toes. <laughs> he kind of, you know, the, the actual actor, the Tor Johnson guy, that he, or the, you know, wrestler and actor that is based on didn't talk like this. But, you know, for some reason they, you know, because it's funny, actually, because this movie's a comedy for sure. Uh, George the Animal Steel has this very you know, kind of like a dumb guy, like a cartoon character is what he plays in this movie where he's just like, I am strong, I will hurt you, you know, that kind of thing. How, how do you think Johnny Depp did as the titular Ed Wood? Actually, I, I thought he was, I thought he was fantastic. Uh, he's, a, he's a little cartoony as well, but I get the impression and just having a, doing a little read up of the film, uh, they figured that Ed Wood had been like shit on for like 50 years already. So I think they kind of wanted to celebrate him a bit. <laughs> and, and I think Johnny Depp's performance really brings out the, uh, that kind of love letter homage to Ed Wood. Uh, he's a little, I don't mean this in a, a negative way. Like he's almost overly positive, I guess, but I think they were going for a certain tone here, and they could they couldn't really delve too deeply into every facet of Edward. So I think they they concentrated on the on the right stuff for the for the movie for sure. Yeah, I think that's extremely accurate. The character of Ed Wood in this movie, played by Johnny Depp, is extremely positive. We only see him, like, he goes through so much shit, and he, we only see him lose his cool one time. And, <laughs> like, he, he cannot, I mean, and even then he comes back all inspired and happy and everything. So, like, he, like, this movie is, a, you know, there's a series of scenes in this movie where he gets down just a little bit and then is immediately inspired by something that happens in his life. Life, and his movies are absolute shit and like his response to people's criticisms are always hilarious you know like in one scene uh you know a producer says to him that's the worst movie i've ever seen and he goes well my next one will be better <laughs> like, <laughs> it's awesome <laughs> It's so awesome. And like, you know, in the beginning, they're reading review of a play that he wrote and they're like, you know, they said something about the costumes looking good. And he's like, well, that's a positive thing right there. I've I've seen reviews where they don't even mention the costumes, you know, (laughs) it's awesome. So the movie's chock full of that. He's awesome. And then we got to talk about probably the best actor in the movie, uh, the guy that steals the show. And that's Martin Landau playing Bela Lugosi. What did you think of this? Absolutely amazing. Uh, I, I, yeah, he, he steals the show in pretty much every scene that he's in. Like, he just embodies Bella Lugosi. Now, I, I, he's probably playing an exaggerated version of Bella, just like Johnny is with Ed Wood, but he plays this kind of washed-up actor who can't get into work really perfectly. And maybe that, maybe that was Martin Landau for a time as well. Uh, because I think his his star has always kind of ebbed and flowed with uh, with the time. So he, he wasn't always a big movie actor. I think in the seventies he's doing like Space nineteen ninety nine and cheesy TV and 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 then it's Mission Impossible and stuff. But uh, people forget like he he's, he was also in some major movies. I think like North by Northwest and a few other ones. So uh, I think. Choosing Martin Landau to play 
this old washed up uh, horror movie star was just just perfect and he embodies it so well he's fantastic in this movie um his scenes give me chills and i mean i i watched a a good chunk of this while i was at work today and man I was giggling, I was smiling. Every time he was on the screen, I was feeling something, you know, and and uh, and he's a complicated character. We'll get into that, you know, but he's very complicated. And a lot of these characters are very complicated, you know, and there's a lot to them. Um and, you know, I just think he did great. Now, there are um there's Sarah Jessica Parker who plays um kind of uh Johnny Depp's girlfriend, um and her name is Kathy. And then there is Patricia Arquette, who plays kind of a future girlfriend of his. We have Sorry. Jeffrey. Yes, sir. Just to stop you there, uh, I'm cheating because I've got IMDb right in front of me. Uh, Sarah Jessica Parker is Dolores. Shit. And Patricia Arquette is Kathy O'Hara. Thank you. Thank you. That would I would have cleared that up later, but thank you. I appreciate it. I, I didn't put it next to the, the names of the people. I just put it in the text of all the notes, so I, I effed it up. My bad. Thank you, Luke, for saving my ass. Um, <laughs> and then we have noted pedophile Jeffrey Jones, of course, um, you know, who is his life has uh, taken a turn for the worst. He may be dead, too. I'm not sure. And then Bill Murray. What did you think of Bill Murray in this movie? Wait, that you just dropped a bomb on me there. I had no idea that. Uh, oh wow, okay, that uh, Jeffrey Jones was like that. That kind of sucks. Uh, that really sucks. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yes, he he's a terrible I, person. Yes. I thought Bill Murray was a delight. He he really threw himself into the role of this. Um, I guess I guess uh, the character he played, Bunny, is. Uh, kind of a person that in the 50s he was probably always going to have a hard time of it but I reckon if he was around today hopefully you know touch wood his life would have been um, full of a lot more acceptance and a lot easier but uh, he seemed kind of a, 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 a bunny seemed pretty troubled but also really dry and really funny he's great yeah, he's definitely a source of amusement, um, comic relief. And, you know, kind of what you're dancing around a little bit is that he is, I guess, what you would term nowadays a pre-operation trans person, right? So, um, yeah. and that's a big uh, theme through this movie uh, because we're going to find out that, you know, Ed Wood has a couple idiosyncrasies that make him different than your average director and your average person back in the day. And, um, man... It, that kind of stuff is handled so well in this movie. It is awesome. It's like celebrated, you know, and the characters who accept the people for who they are are viewed as the good guys and the people who don't are viewed as the bad guys. And that's the way it should be in this movie. I, I'm really telling you guys, this is a tremendous movie, very well made, and every character makes sense and and does the right things, you know. Um, but uh, anyway, are you ready to get into this thing? Oh, I'm pumped. Yep. All right. Well, we open up on this amazing credit sequence, and it's introed by Jeffrey Jones, who sits up in a coffin, and we got this creepy music with a theremin, and it, and you know, and basically we're following the cameras, following around in a graveyard, and each grave has the actor's name on it, and it ends up on the Hollywood sign, and we see L.A. below. And what'd you think of this opening sequence? I mean, it's awesome, right? It's uh. It's actually straight out of, I think, uh, Plan 9. It's very Plan 9 with the uh, the gravestones and stuff. Now, uh, you're referring to Plan 9 from Outer Space, which is one of Ed Wood's movies. I think it's his last one, maybe, or his last big one, you know, before he started doing the, the nudie monster pics, as they call them. So, um, but, <laughs> but yeah, you know. Eddie, you know, Ed Wood is our main character, and that's played by Johnny Depp, as we said before. He's a, a wide-eyed young guy that just sees the world as this wonderful place that he can just, if he could just get the money to make the picture, you know? And uh, he paces outside the theater, and no press has arrived, right? Um, and we find out. And Bill Murray, who is playing Bunny Breckenridge, acts concerned as we enter the theater to see a crappy war play going on. Um, and there are barely any fans in the crowd. And did you notice what was sitting in some of the seats in the theater there? Yeah, buckets of water because the place is, uh, <laughs> the place is dripping. 
<laughs> so there's like one, one old lady sitting in, in the front row or something, and right next to her is a bucket that's almost <laughs> ready to overflow of, uh, of dripping water. <laughs> she looks awesome. bored shitless, by the way. Yes, and they find out that no none of the critics had showed up, right? And so, you know, what's funny, too, is that the movie begins with a thunderstorm, and it also ends with a thunderstorm, which is some nice kind of, you know, rhyming symmetry for a movie there. And um, so... <laughs> it just works. <laughs> so, um, let's see here. Uh, so the cast after the play, and the play is terrible. We got these two actors, like, in a foxhole, and, you know, and they're like, oh, my gosh, we're, we're never going to get out of here, you see? And then a, a angel kind of appears above them and says some bullshit. And these are all these characters that we've mentioned that are in the movie because, you know, Ed Wood has this group of actors that he uses, and that's it. And these are kind of like our main characters for the movie. Um, so the cast after that, the cast go and they drink at a bar and they read reviews of the show and we get the infamous Sarah Jessica Parker horse face comment. Did you know that that was from this movie? No. So <laughs> if you, if so, everyone knows Sarah Jessica Parker, yes, there's very, very beautiful woman, but yes, kind of equine in the face, I guess. Uh, <laughs> That, uh, that joke, I was like, oh, man, I wonder if she hates this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, they're reading the reviews, and one of the reviews, reviewers says something about how she has a horse face. She goes, do I look like a horse or something? And so that's where that comes from. That's that's where that's, that joke comes from, and it's still to this day is alive, unfortunately for her. Um you know, it, <laughs> so we learn that Ed is overly positive, as we mentioned before, and his girlfriend can't find her pink sweater. This scene is hilarious. Tell me, did you do you remember this? Tell me the scene where she's talking about her pink sweater and then um, Ed's reaction to her talking about this. Yeah, she can't find it. And she's looking through all her wardrobes and shit like that. And it, it kind of cuts to uh, Eddie's face and he's just going. <laughs> Ooh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know where that is. I've got no idea. And, <laughs> and she's, I think, I think it's either there or later on that she's complaining that uh, her, her sweater is stretched out. The Angora sweater specifically, like he has this yeah. like thing for Angora sweaters, and so. It's funny because that thread goes throughout the whole movie and eventually, you know, he starts to kind of be who he wants to be and everything. But it's just funny at first because he's trying to hide this from everybody that he likes to wear women's clothing, you know, um, so <laughs> that's pretty great. Um, Ed arrives at a Hollywood backlot carrying a tree for some reason. I don't know why. And he boasts that he could make a whole movie out of stock footage. <laughs> Which is a, a straight up joke about Ed Wood's overuse of stock footage. Now, um, you happen to watch an Ed Wood movie, uh, you know, in preparation for this, and we'll get into that in more detail a little later. But did you notice an overuse of stock footage in that movie? Yes. <laughs> uh, so I figured, like, Everyone's heard of or seen Plan 9 from Outer Space, right? Everyone knows that infamous movie. And I decided, you know, fuck it, I'm going to watch Glenn or Glenda. Movies like just over an hour, and most of the movie is narration and stock footage. <laughs> it's And this is what is fun about this movie is that Ed Wood is terrible at making movies, but gosh, does he love it? He loves it so much. He believes in everyone that's acting. He believes in what he's doing, even though he fucking sucks at it, you know, and he uses every kind of shortcut he can, every kind of incorrect thing he can do. And, and we'll learn more and more about that later. Um, he, he learns at this point that there's a biopic being made about a crossdresser. And Ed really wants to make this movie, and he claims that he has kind of a distinct uh, quality that could, you know, that could help him direct this this show, you know. Uh, and he talks to a guy at Screen Classic Studios, and he admits to the guy that he is a transvestite uh, in order to get the job, but he gets turned down. <laughs> Poor guy, Jesus. <laughs> oh man. And and I. Good. Sorry, sorry, I just want to point out that. Uh, this guy that he's talking to, 
to uh, I guess get the directing gig. He's he's a character actor you would have seen in a lot of things. Uh, I think most people recognize him from Dumb and Dumber. He is the guy sitting between Jeff Daniels and Jim Carrey when Jim Carrey is like, you want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? That's him. <laughs> yeah, he's been in a ton of stuff. He usually plays kind of a gangster character or criminal of some kind. He's an asshole. And that's that's you know, that's the thing is that the the people there's only one character that kind of straddles the line of being an asshole or not, and that's uh Dolores. Everybody else is kind of cut or dry, whether they're on Ed's side or they're not. And so that's the characters that are on his side are cool people that are good, that are, are comfortable with themselves, and the people who are not are not. So it's a pretty cool deal. Um so let's see here. So he he admits that he gets turned down and then the fucking star of the show shows up because Ed walks by a coffin shop where ba- he sees Bela Lugosi lying in a coffin, just like he's Dracula. And he rises out of the coffin and Bella berates the guy who's selling coffins. Oh, this is too cramped. <laughs> so he finds out it's Bela Lugosi. And, you know, we find out that Ed Wood is a massive fan of Bela Lugosi. What do you know about Bela Lugosi, uh, Luke? Uh, I've seen a couple of his older movies, uh, White Zombie, uh, Dracula, uh, just a couple of things like that. I, I have never done really a, a deep dive into his, his stuff, but uh, I think if you've watched any amount of horror movies, he's a name that will pop up many, many times. Uh, so, yeah, I'm... Shit, we made we made making this podcast in the wrong decade. If we were doing this in the fifties, we'd probably be like riffing on uh, Bella Lugosi movies for like twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah, he um, you know, I I grew up in a household that loved horror movies, and we're not talking about critters and the goofy horrors that came out in the eighties and nineties. We're talking about the classic horror movies, and you know, Bo- Bella Lugosi and Bo- Boris Karloff, especially, who are rivals according to this movie. Um, you know, they were two people that I was very familiar with. I mean, you know, Dr. Zorba, somebody, you know, that that movie I'm familiar with and obviously Dracula. And if you think of the classic Dracula saying, I want to suck your blood, that's fucking Bela Lugosi. That's who we're talking yeah. about here. Now, Martin Landau crushes this part. I mean, this might be one of the best acting um, roles of all time. It is just out of this world good. And like I said, anytime he's on screen, you're glued to him. And a neat little trick that they do is that anytime he's on the screen, so is Ed Wood glued to him. If you notice, Ed Wood can't just take his, he can't take his eyes off Bella and everything Bella does. He's just mesmerized by. And, and that as you know, so like through Ed Wood, you're kind of as a, viewer you're kind of seeing it through his eyes so you're becoming this positive person overlooking some of the things that are problems because ed wood has this glow in his eyes when he sees uh bela lugosi so bela he gets out of this um coffin and he tries to get on a bus and ed wood's like ride a bus what do you need that for and he's like i got a car so they get in the car and we learn that bella has kind of fallen on hard times and they reminisce about uh when movies were better and, uh, you know, about the real horror movies. And uh, Martin Landau just just is outstanding in this. What would you think about this kind of introduction to him? I really I really liked it. And it is it is a thread throughout the whole movie that uh, Ed Wood, eyes glued, uh, Bela Lugosi, who is definitely not a perfect human being, has had problems and hard times. Ed Wood doesn't see any of that. He just sees a fucking megastar. He's he, it's like he idolizes the ground that Bella Lugosi walks on, and he just can't believe that uh, this guy is a washed-up actor who just can't get any work. And I don't think it, it doesn't even click for him straight away to put Bella in a, a movie, but it, uh, he, he's just kind of in awe at at first. Yeah, he sees opportunity. But 
he doesn't see opportunity in the way that someone who you might describe as opportunistic would see it because usually that's a negative trait. You know, Ed Wood sees opportunity in a positive, you know, way that's kind of innocent and naive. And that's like, he's extremely naive. And that's one of the reasons why he gets into trouble too. Uh, Cause he just believes everything people say. And he's an idiot when it comes to that. So, <laughs> so we, we fast forward to Halloween um, and Ed visits Bela again and they watch white zombie together, which, you know, I had experience like this once. Um, one time I went to Les Thatcher's house and I watched um, a bunch of wrestling with him, you know, and it was kind of like the same thing. It was like, oh, my God, I'm with, you know, Les Thatcher, this like 75 year old dude who wrestled, had his first match in 1960, you know, and uh, and I'm watching some of his old matches with him. It was really neat. It brought me back to that. Um, but. You know, what happens is, is that, you know, Bela is getting into this and he's reciting some of the lines and stuff. This scene is incredible. It might be my favorite scene in the movie because he sees Vampira and Vampira is like the Elvira <laughs> of the time. Right. And he, <laughs> you know, and and uh, what is Ed Woods like? Man, I, I hate when she interrupts the picture, you know, and and Bella's like, I think she's beautiful. And he starts casting a spell on her and say, you know, and it's amazing. It's so great. Um, but then Bella, oh, son- <laughs> go ahead, Luke. Tell me, tell me about this a little bit. All right. So Bella is thought the exact same thing I was thinking and this is like something that I'd be thinking and not saying but uh, he's watching the movie and then vamp- Vampira comes out <laughs> and uh, yeah Edward's like I hate how she disrespects movies and he's like I think she's a honey <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice jugs and he starts doing this these, these finger motions that you might have seen him do in, in his movies. And Edward's like, how do you do that? He's like, you need to be double-jointed <laughs> and <laughs> Hungarian. <laughs> that shit is awesome. And we, we learn about Bela that he misses that part of his life. I mean, he he says he, he – later on he says that he turned down Frankenstein because it, it's not sexy. You know, and he has to be a he thought he was a sex symbol. So, you know, he said he'd never get laid if he was Frankenstein. Right. You know, and meanwhile, it, like ruined his career. So, you know, he he's uh, made some poor choices. And um, but man, does he want to he wants to get in um, the vampire's panties for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, Bella also suddenly doesn't feel very good and he has to go take his medicine. Right. So he goes in the other room. And and this is the wide-eyed Ed Wood. Doesn't even see a problem here. Doesn't even have any idea. But Bela comes back out from behind this curtain, and he's a new man. He basically skips and jumps to the front door, right? <laughs> he, yeah. So he opens the door. He's like, children, I love children. And he opens the door, and these trick-or-treaters are out there, and he scares the piss out of all of them except for one. One doesn't want to run away. He's not scared. He's like, you're not scary. So Ed Wood, who is a war veteran, and this is a way that he kind of tells people he's manly. You know, he's like, oh, I was in the war. And he he takes he takes his front teeth out and holds them up and scares the kid. And he's like, oh, I lost I lost my pearlies in the war, he says. And so that scares the children. So they kind of bond over scaring children together, which is what horror movies are to, are for so you know they've made this bond and now they want to scare children together you know? it's pretty awesome so what you think about all this uh, this might be my favorite scene in the movie i love this so much it's a it's a wonderful scene and i think the, what's amazing to me is and i think we'll probably talk about it later on but uh, bella lugosi doesn't seem to really judge Eddie's directing style or anything like that. Uh, Ed's happy to work. Like he loves working with, uh, with his idol and Bella is just so happy to work. <laughs> he is. That it's kind no, of a, a match made in heaven. Yeah. And no one cares about him. So, I mean, we even later on, we get, you know, the, the facts that, that Bela has no one to turn to. So Ed is his friend, his legitimate friend. And so the the idiosyncrasies that Ed has, 
Bela accepts and the idiosyncrasies that Bela has, Ed accepts. And it's a beautiful thing. This is a, the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Yep. So uh, Ed pitches a movie uh, with Bela, meaning like he wants to put Bela in a movie to the studio. And the studio head agrees and Ed is kind of off to the races. He presents his script and his true self to his girlfriend. So he has, you know, the idea is he's supposed to be writing the script about a transgender person and or a, excuse me, not a transgender person. I'm sorry, a, uh, a transvestite. There we go. So yeah. transvestite. And so he's, um, you know, trying to kind of reveal this to her after she's read his script. And it, it doesn't go so well. Um, she's not happy, but she agrees to do the movie. And we kind of realize that maybe she sees this as an opportunity to be an actress. And maybe that's it. We're not sure. She's kind of on the fence, like I said. What do you think of her character, the Sarah Jessica Parker, uh, Dolores character? I think I think the movie might paint her a little uh, negatively, but I often thought that when Dolores had a problem, it was usually for a pretty good reason. <laughs> uh, and it was – and Eddie is just such an easygoing – fun person he doesn't want to hurt anyone or anything like that but uh he will do whatever he has to to get a movie made and uh dolores will uh doesn't he, she never likes some of the extent to what uh, uh edward would go to to make a flick and she also never fully accepts him either. that's true that's true which is why you know, I kind of put her in that category of on the fence because she's with him. She's helping him make the movie, but she doesn't accept his idiosyncrasies and the, the issues that he has. Because he he shows her, you know, he basically the idea is when I say he reveals his true self, he, he shows her that he's dressed like a woman and they have a discussion about it. And he says he just likes it. And, you know, and the immediate reaction of most people in the movie when he reveals that to him is they say, oh, well, you, you don't like women. And he's like, no, I love women. I just... He says that many times in the movie where he just says, oh, I love women. You know, he just says he likes to wear women's clothing. What's the big deal? You know, so and like I said, most of the good characters in the movie that are good people, they're like, OK, whatever, you know. So they begin yeah. filming the Glenn, Glenn or Glenda. Right. And uh, this is the movie you watch. So we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, and Ed is playing the lead role, <laughs> which is not was not discussed at any point. You know, this is just something that kind of pops up out of nowhere that he's playing the lead, the lead role. And we learn that Ed has no idea what he's doing. He doesn't understand coverage shots. He doesn't understand protection shots and he doesn't understand permits. Basically one of the camera guys a couple times in the movie calls him out and says, Hey, maybe we should get that from a different angle. And he's like, for what? It was perfect. And he's like, well, for protection. And he's like, protect what? It was great. Cut print. <laughs> it's, it's awesome so tell me about this movie that they made this glenn it's glenn or glenda right isn't that the name of the movie yeah so it, it it's on youtube if anyone's curious enough i think most of his movies are because they're all in the public domain now uh it's it's awful it is fucking horrendous most of the movie as i've mentioned is stock footage and narration. So there's very little dialogue between actors in scenes. Usually you'll see an actor uh, portraying something as the narrator tells you what the fuck's going on. And there's a, there's this long, really long, surreal dream kind of montage complete with a guy with devil horns and like, like a devil. And it's all about like uh, how, is this is this behavior evil? Is it good? Will people accept it? Will they not? Um, there's no like a lot of some of the movies narrated by this uh, doctor who's talking to a policeman because there's a, a cross dresser at the start of the movie who was so unaccepted that that, uh, that person killed himself and that's awful. And so this cop goes to this doctor and he's like, look, we will. We need to understand this. We don't want this to keep happening. So what can you tell me about this? And this this doctor, like, just takes patient-client confidentiality and just wipes his ass with it and just <laughs> names names, tells them, that, tell, 
and this is a vehicle for uh, Ed Wood to tell uh, different stories about people in this world, like uh, one getting a sex change, uh, one person who's um, trans. And they never say the word trans because I think that's a term that came a lot later, but they pretty much say everything except the term trans. So, and and as I said, as you said, uh, he plays Glenn or Glenda. So I think that takes a bit of brass balls. Uh, it's an awful movie, but also strangely ahead of its time and full of courage as well. So I kind of respect him for it. It's it's interesting. We're about to come up to a scene here. Let's just get there. So, because um, this is very interesting, this point you just made. Um, so Bela Lugosi arrives on the set. And he immediately asked for money, which is hilarious. That's like, it remi- <laughs> reminds me of Jake the Snake and, uh, you know, and Beyond the Mat, where he just immediately asked for money. <laughs> so it's, uh, and and uh, the makeup guy sees the track marks on Bella's arm. And this is when it's confirmed that he is, you know, a morphine addict or some kind of, uh, you know, heroin type addict, right? Um, so Bela loses his mind when someone mentions Boris Karloff to him. And then he just says, they're like, they're like, are you upset? You don't want to go right now? And he's like, no, I'm ready. And then he just absolutely murders the scene. I mean, just crushes it. But then we see the scene between Ed and his girlfriend and they're playing the characters in the movie. And we, and this is when I started to realize this, these movies, the things that he's writing are all some kind of fantasy for him so that he could, you know, he's writing his life as he would like it to be. And so he is revealing in the movie you know, the thing that he's revealed to his girlfriend in real life, but it goes much better, you know, in the movie, of course. So it's, you know, it's a very interesting kind of dichotomy there with him, you know, and and it's also extremely childish. You know, if you, if you read a story that a, you know, a five-year-old wrote, I mean, there's going to be a lot of coincidences between your main character and that five-year-old and things that they do. Right. I mean, this is kind of what I see in this is just kind of immaturity as a writer, but also him just wanting to be in this world he's creating. What do you think of that? Yeah, that's, that's what I kind of like. There's definitely a naivety about it. And even still, like, even though he's a shit script writer, a shit director, this is like, in the 50s, he was able to, like, put out there into the world for all time, like, this is who I am, and, you know, it wouldn't be such a bad thing if people accepted it, because I'm not hurting anyone. So, the, as I said, look, the movie is just trash garbage. There's so much stock footage in, this is Glenn or Glenda, I mean, not Ed Wood, which is amazing. Uh, there's so much um, stock footage and narration there's not even an hour. It's just over an hour of the movie. There's not there's not enough story to even cover it. So this is like <laughs> maybe uh, half that is maybe movie story. The rest is just that. But the underlying message of it is a very positive one. And I and I yeah. So it's a it uh, you shit on it, but as a as a historical kind of document for 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 these kinds of things it's i think i think it's actually good in that way all right well you heard it here luke recommends glenn or glenda so uh <laughs> <laughs> all right so our character our main our hero ed wood he arrives at like a bigger studio um you know than he usually is at and he's trying to pitch his next movie and and he's got his canisters of his you know of glenn or glenda with him of the film so the suit guy is like, all right, well, you just leave it here and we'll watch it. So they start watching his movie and uh, they all think it's a joke, the the studio guys, because they think it's like some friend of theirs that's playing a joke on them. And uh, the studio head uh, he's been working with fires him from uh, the whatever the other the guy from um, from Dumber Dumber. He fires him because their movie did not do well in Alabama. So. <laughs> Which is where it came out, which is awesome. So uh, then we got Bill Murray, Ed, and his girlfriend are at a wrestling match. Oh, my God. 
And uh, I think this scene is done very well. It's like a packed house. They're not in the front row or anything. They're kind of up towards the, you know, the top actually. And some of them don't feel like that they really want to be there. I mean, the the girlfriend doesn't seem like she wants to be there. And this is where we get Bill Murray discussing his ch- his sex change loudly. And it's great because Ed is totally cool. He wants to hear all about it, right? But um, but Dolores, the the girlfriend, is like, would you be quiet? Because he's just talking about goodbye, penis, you know, and stuff like that. It's, he says he wants to go to Mexico and and have a sex change, right? Dolores very much has the attitudes of the era towards this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, like uh, it's it's weird, it's wrong, um, or you should just kind of hide that and not kind of reveal that to anyone that's kind of where Dolores is at and she's sitting uncomfortably between uh Bunny and Ed as they're having a really like frank animated discussion about it like it's it's totally cool it's normal like hey if if you're gonna feel happier doing that Ed Wood's like go for it dude you should you should totally do that (laughs) I forgot. There's also a scene earlier where Bela Lugosi walks into Ed's room and he's like, come on in. And he's on the phone with somebody. He's like, get me transvestites. I need as many transvestites as you can get me. You know, it's so, <laughs> like Ed is totally cool with this whole thing. And he's he's way ahead of his time when it comes to discussing this. But that's also because, as his girlfriend points out later on, he hangs out with this in this kind of bubble of people who are all okay with all the different things that each other does. So, which is a a place we all hope that we can make it to at some time, you know. Uh, so, Bill Murray discusses this. It's fucking awesome. And then, uh, you know, and then we see Ed get those stars in his eyes again because one of the wrestlers is George the Animal Steel, and he and Ed is so impressed with them. Uh, George the Animal Steel actually like gorilla presses a guy into the crowd too, which is awesome. And like, uh, into the crowd, the crowd doesn't even move. Like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and we get kayfabe too because back in the locker room, you know, uh, I, I actually I'll let you tell this story, tell this part. So what what's going on in the locker room between George and this masseuse, and then like the other wrestler walks by? Did you catch this? Yeah. So George is, uh, oh, I should say, uh, Tor Tor Johnson's getting like he's on this massage table, getting getting a massage, you know, as he eats a fucking full chicken. <laughs> <laughs> as, you, as you do and uh he's having a bit of a talk with uh eddie and the the wrestler that he threw into the crowd walks in he's like i'll get you next time and uh tor's like yeah whatever you know be, and that was really nice it's like they saw it's like they saw the masseuse there and they saw eddie there and they're like well we're not breaking character for this no way that shit would have been a lot more guarded back in the 50s then as well than it, than it was today. And and this is also an example. Um, Eddie keeps running into these people who are phonies in a lot of ways, right? But he accepts them for on face value. So, like, we don't get this scene where George explains to Ed that, that wrestling's fake or whatever, but we do get that scene later with another character. And so it's fun to see Ed, just his eyes, he, he you know, he buys this guy as a tough guy and everything, and it, it's just awesome. And and he, as you said earlier, George, the animal, Steel is getting this massage, and he's like, do my toes to the massage guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Eddie pitches him to be in a movie, and George agrees. He's like, great, let's do it. And uh, so then we get late at night, Eddie's asleep, and this is when shit starts to get a little more serious. He gets a call from Bela, and Bela is like, help me, Andy, help me. And so this is when we find out that Bela has no one, right? Um, Eddie shows up at his house. Bela has overdosed on morphine and at, with a Demerol chaser, he says. He says yeah. <laughs> and, and Bela cries because he's broke. But this inspires Ed Wood somehow, like <laughs> – the thing is so great about him is he sees his, his one of his best friends, you know, his idol is almost dead from from drug use and like it's just terrible for him and he gets inspired by this somehow. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so what is the master of uh, grabbing lemons and 
not making lemonade because he's not that good, but making something that might approximate lemonade. <laughs> a, a yellow, how about a yellow liquid? There it is. So, <laughs> so Ed shows up to the distributor or that, you know, the bigger studio, right, that he had gone to show the picture that they thought it was the worst thing they'd ever seen. And they won't even let him in. So he's on the phone outside and they're like, this is the worst picture you've ever seen. That's when he's like, well, my next one will be better like that. <laughs> it's awesome. He doesn't even frown. He's super happy about it. So to Ed be fair so- to those producers, though, they they they're kind of right. They hate it for they might hate it for the stock footage and all that, like I do. But they probably hated the underlying message of it too, because you know fifties and stuff like that. But they when they say it's a bad movie, it is. Well, Ed is out of options here for money, so he decides he's going to raise the money on on his own. And there's this running joke, um, too, that we hear here in a couple times other, is is whenever he mentions Bela Lugosi to somebody, they go, "Isn't he dead?" Like, <laughs> everybody, everybody thinks he's dead, but he's not, right? He's almost dead. So um, Ed books Bella. Uh, a spot on a live TV show because Bela needs money, you know, and he botches it completely. But they meet this this character played by the awful Jeffrey Jones, um, and his name's Criswell. And Criswell is like a, a you know, like a, a I don't know what you, I can't think of the guy that would be on Johnny Carson all the time that would predict the future, you know. But it's a, no, that's who dude, that's, that's who him. He, uh, that's, that's him. him. Okay, well there you go. Yeah, so, I, I did a little nerd reading up i think i do more research for these than i do for my reviews because uh you know we're gonna go in depth and talk about it but yeah uh creswell was the guy that would turn up on johnny carson and just predict these stupid things that would never come true well ed is enamored by this guy he can't believe him he's like he or he can't believe it. he's like oh my gosh how does this guy know the future right so they go to dinner and ed learns that creswell is a phony and Criswell says to him, he says, you know, if you dress nice and you you act confident, you can get anything you want. And Ed's inspired by this and throws a big fr- uh, a fundraiser at a place called the Brown Derby, which is a gigantic brown hat. <laughs> it's a restaurant. <laughs> it's a giant brown hat, which is hilarious. And um, and it's and this is for his new movie that's called The Bride of Adam, which is a fucking awesome name for a movie. I love that. It, it ends up getting changed or whatever, but I played a lot of Fallout 4, so to me, Bride of Adam sounds pretty cool. Yeah, I'm um, with they, you there, yeah. But they don't make any money. <laughs> so, in fact, these people that are around, like all these investors, are they, they seem very interested, in it, but they just they aren't interested. You know, I don't know why. Um, but some some cool happens after this, sort of. Um Ed, after the uh, party, he's at the bar just drinking his sars away, and he meets Loretta Kane. And she's a total weirdo, uh, but she wants in if she can play the main role. And here's the deal is that he hears her ordering something, and the and the guy's like, yeah, it'll be $3 or something. And he, she's like, well, I only have a 50 And he's like, oh, maybe she's got some money, right? So, <laughs> the, so he thinks that she's going to – pay for the movie he tells her how much a movie cost and she's like well that's not much at all you know and so he feels like that she's gonna pay for the movie if she takes a certain part but whose part does she want she wants uh dolores's part and uh and because he thinks that uh loretta can uh, finance the movie by the way, Loretta is played by Juliet Landau, which people will know as Drusilla from Buffy. It's also Martin Landau's daughter in real life. Kidding. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was like, they got the same surname. Are they related? Yes, they are. Um, and, of course, Dolores takes it, takes this news very, very, very well. <laughs> Not. <laughs> she, she's chucking things at him. There's like a whole scene of dialogue where he's hiding behind a chair. And she's just throwing stuff at him. It's awesome. <laughs> I loved it. Uh, yeah, so he gives, you know, his girlfriend's part to this person, you know, Loretta, who's going to finance the movie, right? So, <laughs> so this is great. So then we see George the Animal There's Steel. There's nothing sexy about it. Like, like you could – like any other movie, it might have been like, oh, he's had an affair with Loretta or something like that. It's nothing like that at no. all. He just he just thinks, 
oh, she can help finance it. Uh, sorry, Dolores, you're out. It's and it's funny because his girlfriend kind of thinks there's something going on, but the, you know she doesn't say that, and and I don't even think she cares. She just is. It's more about the fact that she's given up her time to be at this part, and now her boyfriend, who she probably doesn't even like anymore, is is screwing her over, and she's just like, how much of this am I going to take? <laughs> so, um, so then we see Tor Johnson, George Steele, uh do a scene where he's supposed to just walk through a door and he runs right into the fucking door. And Ed, Ed is like, <laughs> Ed's like, great, cut it, print it. And the cameraman's like, should we make another take? You know, he, he kind of ran right in the door and, and Ed is like, well, that's realism. He's like, actually in real life, George, the animal steel would have to deal with that on a daily basis. And it's really funny. I love that. <laughs> Did, these scenes where people try to call him out on his shitty movies and then his responses are just awesome. He's the ultimate spin artist, right? Yep. <laughs> I love it. So right in the middle of all this, a bill collector comes up, maybe the owner of the uh, studio they're using, and he wants to collect some money. But Ed doesn't have any. And so he goes up to Loretta and says, hey, so I'm going to need that money now. And she goes, I already gave you the 300 that I was going to put in. And he's like, what about the other 60,000? <laughs> And she says, oh, you misunderstood me, honey. I, I didn't I that's all I was giving you was 300. So not only did he fuck over his girlfriend for this lady, but she's not even paying for the movie. And he is just a giant idiot. right? <laughs> I love this part. I thought that was so funny. I mean, did you see this coming or what did you think of all this? Yeah, I saw it coming. The funny thing is, like, she doesn't. She doesn't look poor by any stretch of the imagination, but she doesn't look like she exudes like money either. She just looks like a, like a normal person at a bar who just so happened to like just be stuck with a fifty and need change. It's like one of us going somewhere and we're like, "Oh, sorry, dude, I've only got I've only got a hundred. Can you break this?" And that does not mean <laughs> it does not mean that you have another sixty grand in the bag. It's just like. It's just like the, the the cash you have on hand. So there's no there's never any indication that she's actually can actually back up or any, any of this money and stuff. She just yeah, it's <laughs> later on later on someone is criticizing his movie making again and he and I believe this is his philosophy in life as well. As he says to him he says movies aren't about the details, they're about the big picture, you know? And <laughs> So like he just can't handle details. He doesn't he doesn't worry about those. That's not a thing that he worries about. It's all about the big picture. So he holds another fundraiser at the Brown Derby again. And uh, Ed tries to, which is hilarious too, because they failed the first time. So let's have it the same place again, you know, because it'll be great. <laughs> and, uh, and he sees Vampira is there. And so he, he is like, oh shit, I'm going to try to get her, recruit her. And so he runs over and tries to recruit her, but he gets shut down begging on his knees in front of all of the possible investors who leave. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Yep. <laughs> So Ed finally finds another backer who requires uh, – he's like a redneck kind of Texas dude, and he, he, he apparently owns some kind of meat you know, uh, meat shop or something like that. But he requires some things. He wants his son to get apart, and he wants a big explosion at the end. And it's great hearing Ed talk to this guy. He's like, well, that's when the doctor falls in the vat. And he's like, I want it to be an explosion. And he's like, but it's the doctor in the vat. Explosion. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> if he doesn't end like that, it does now. <laughs> it's awesome. What's the, you know, um, glittering prizes and endless compromises uh, shatter the illusions of integrity. You know, this is the, 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 ru the rules of life he's learning here, you know. So Dolores shows up on set and she's all pissy. She's really mean to Loretta. And there's funny a fu funny part where he's kind of in between them and he's like, ladies, come on. You know, he's, he has to talk some sense into them. Um, Criswell shows up and helps them steal an octopus prop from the studio. And uh, it, it's funny. They walk up and there's this big lock on there. And so Tor Johnson's with him and he just rips the fucking door like off the hinges, basically. And they walk in. <laughs> That shit is awesome. Um, then, then we get to this outside scene. This is one of the best lit, uh, best camera work uh, scenes in the whole movie. They're basically surrounding 
a little uh, pond that they're going to shoot in. It's pitch black outside, but they have cars that are parked along the outside. So you see them in the distance kind of lighting the scene. Incredible. Uh, the, the the camera work and stuff on the scene. Um, but Bela is not quite ready. Um, you know, he he's going to take a little nap, but actually all he does is shoot up in the car and then he comes up and he's ready to do this. What you think about this whole, uh, you know, him rolling around in the in the in the uh, thing with the octopus? I thought this was pretty cool. This has one of my favorite lines in it, and I'm gonna, probably going to butcher it. But uh, Bella gets his uh, feet in the water and he's like, it's it's cold. <laughs> and Ed Wood just yells out, uh, it, it, it'll, it'll warm up as you get used to it. And he's like, fuck you, you get down in here. Yes. <laughs> it's he's like, how come the, how come it's not moving? It's like, uh, we forgot to, we forgot to steal the motor. So just like put it around you and, uh, pretend like it's attacking you and stuff. <laughs> And he does, and, and it's does. awesome. It's absolutely and, awesome, you know. And um, Bella's like seventy something in this part. In, in this scene, he's seventy. It's late at night. He has to act out a scene in freezing cold water and pretend like this really fake looking octopus is messing him up. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, and then we get Bela shoots his final speech of the movie. Um, which is just an absolutely incredible scene. And, and that's a wrap uh, for, um, you know, the Bride of Adam, but it's actually now called the Bride of the Monster, right? Uh, so we go to the brat party. Uh, Bill Murray has a really funny scene with George Steele where he talks about his ill-fated trip to Mexico, <laughs> which is great. He didn't end up getting the, the operation because of all I kinds of I actually love terror. that scene because um, you see a guy like Tor Johnson, this big – muscly fucking manly man's man right and he's actually he actually wants to know he's like hey i i heard you went to mexico how was that and i actually thought that was pretty cool because eddie doesn't just collect people that are, are, are weird and he accepts them but they all kind of accept each other as well it's true. He he doesn't he doesn't say did you go to Mexico. He says I heard you were going to become a lady. That's what he says. And he sits there intently listening on how that went because he genuinely wants to know. Just like you said, it's awesome. But it doesn't work out because basically, uh, Bill Murray Bunny he describes like every terrible thing that could possibly happen to someone. That's what happened to him when he went to Mexico. <laughs> so it didn't work out yet. But you know he's going to do it in the future maybe. So and then we see. This is so weird. So Eddie is dressed like a belly dancer with a velour kind of sleeves on, and he dances at the party. Um, and Dolores, this is a funny-ass scene. So Dolores finally loses her shit. She screams, and, it, like, everyone just, like, splits like the Red Sea. And you can just see her, you know, like, basically the camera's at one end of this crowd of people. She screams. They split like the Red Sea so we can see her directly right down the, the barrel of the, of the uh, camera. And she says, you are idiots. This movie is terrible. It's the worst piece of shit ever. And she just loses it. And it's a hilarious scene. What would you think about this? Well, all right. So I haven't seen um, what they eventually called Bride of the Monster instead of Bride of the Atom. I have not seen this one yet. It's. For anyone interested, it's also a Mystery Science Theater 3000 episode, which you, you can watch that version or the original version also on uh, on the YouTubes. But uh, I think she was only complaining that Bride of the Monster was a piece of shit because she didn't get to play the main role because she did not complain that Glenn or Glenda was the steaming turd. But it is. Uh, I, but uh, I, I think... I think also a part of her is kind of waking up to the fact that, like, uh, if I'm going to have a career, I'm probably going to have to have to do it away from all these weirdos. <laughs> She's, you know, she makes a good point, but she does it in like a very negative way, you know, and uh, and so she dumps Ed right then and there, you know, and um, we see Ed alone at home and he's watching TV and. He receives another call from Bella late at night and help me, help me, Eddie, you know, and Ed arrives to find Bella with a gun 
destitute because his unemployment's been canceled. <laughs> and uh, Balo wants Ed to join him in the afterlife. So he's like, come on, let's kill each other. It'll be great. You know, but Ed's like, no, I don't think that's a good idea. And Bela agrees to go to rehab. Um, what do you think about this? I mean, this scene is so sad and funny all at the same time. Yeah, it, it, just when you just when you think like Bella Lugosi hasn't fallen far enough, you find out that he was on like unemployment benefits just to survive. That's <laughs> terrible. And his his house is trashed. He's he's definitely hopped up on uh, goofballs. And he's yeah he's it's like he's like maybe we should we should definitely go. You should come with me. <laughs> Holding the gun up to Eddie's head, like he doesn't expect Eddie to shoot himself. So don't, don't worry, Bella will do it for you. Then he'll do it himself. <laughs> he's he's that messed up that he thinks this is all a great idea. So you know, Eddie talks him out of it, like I said, and he goes to rehab. And the scene where he walks up, I mean, this is just some of the best acting you'll ever see. He walks up to the to the counter and this woman's like, you know, lo- dressed like Nurse Ratchet. And she's like, you know, how can I help you? And he's like, I am Bela Lugosi and I have been a heroin addict for 20 years and I need help. And he's losing his mind. It is spectacular. So Eddie stays the night there and he wakes up the next day and he notices – Patricia Arquette, uh, Kathy, wearing an Angora sweater in the lobby. And he's immediately like, oh, my God, who is this? <laughs> so, which is just fantastic that he is obsessed with these Angora sweaters. It's just it's just a funny through line in the movie. Um, the press learns about Bela being in rehab. So Eddie shows up and he shoes him away. But Bela's like, he's like, what the hell, man? They were all finally paying attention to me. I, he said he's the first um, – uh, actor to go into rehab openly and uh, he's and you know and Ed's like well they'll exploit you and he's like let them it's fine he and and, and this is where we see Bela kind of get some of that optimism that Eddie has where he says he believes that he's going to come back strong you know at once he's healthy he can get out of there and he can make his comeback as an actor you know um, it, it was it sad to you this scene because I mean you're starting to get the idea that maybe Bela's not long for this world just because of all the problems he's having. He's also not long for this world. He's also not going to have a resurgence of a career making shit like Glenn or Glenda and <laughs> Ride of the Atom or the upcoming Plan 9 from Outer Space. Like, <laughs> you know, making these flicks is definitely, like, he got more attention in the uh, rehab clinic <laughs> In, 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 at least in this movie, it seemed like he got more attention in rehab than he did being in any of Edward's movies itself. It's true. It's very true. <laughs> All right. So Ed, he sees Kathy again. Her dad is in rehab and she knits things. She's knitted to Bayla some socks. It's just they're, they're black to match his cape, which is pretty great. And Ed and her go on a date at a fair and they enter the spook house, which is like a you know, like a scary ride. And it, it's funny because as they're going through this ride, they have to like duck stuff and get out of the way. And they just seem to both know it by heart, you know, but the ride stops and Ed really likes Kathy. And he decides to just go ahead and come clean with her. And he says, listen, I like to dress like a woman. And she's like, Oh, so you don't like women. You don't like sex with women. He's like, no, I love it. You know? And she goes, Oh, okay. And she's totally cool with it. And so she's now part of the team, you know? Um, I Patricia Arquette, I love the movie she's in. I don't really think she's that great of an actor because she never emotes. She kind of just is there, you know? And I, I wish that she was more emotive. What What do you think about her as an actor? I mean, you've probably seen Lost Highway, right? And she she's in oh, that. Not just Lost Highway, but um, True Romance as well. Yeah. I mean, she's better in True Romance because she actually has stuff to do. But I just – I always think of Lost Highway where she's just there. You know what I mean? She's just a thing to look at, you know? And in this movie, she actually has some stuff to do. Okay, fair enough, you know? I think, like, because Patricia at some point, like, in um, – I'm going on a tangent. Lost Highway, she's like, 
naked and kind of surrounded by all these kind of ogling dudes and stuff. So, yeah. But, um, look, there have been actors that get hired because they are stunning and easy on the eye. It's been going on since movies began, and it goes on kind of now. And there's nothing wrong with that, really. Like, watch anything on the CW or whatever, you know? Like, <laughs> she's, she's perfectly fine, but she's definitely overshadowed by almost everyone in the flick. Yeah, everybody's acting circles around her in this movie, you know, and and that's fine. I mean, you, you sometimes you need a straight man or straight woman or whatever you want to call it to kind of like highlight the other stuff that's going on in the movie. And I don't think they wanted her to be some kind of complicated, weird character with all kinds of stuff. But she's on Team Eddie, so she's 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 somebody we like in the movie. Um, Bela gets kicked out of rehab. Uh, because his insurance, he's not insured and he's broke and Eddie makes it up. He's like, the, it's funny because the doctor, again, doctor patient uh, privilege is out the window. He, the, the doctor tells Eddie like, you know, hey, he doesn't have any money. He's got to go. So Eddie tells um, Bela, oh, you're fixed. You're, you're, you're cured. And uh, so he makes up. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and so he makes up some bullshit for Bela to film. Uh, to raise his spirits. And this ends up being like one of the great, like one of the scenes that they show a few times in the movie that kind of evokes emotion from you because we know it's Bela's last scene, you know, and he's on the porch of this house and he's just kind of looking at this tree and talking, you know, and it's very neat. So after that, Ed invites uh, Vampira, Vampira, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, and uh, the cast uh, to see Bride of the Monster, which is uh, the new name of Ed's film, as we discussed, changed from Bride of Adam. Uh, the theater's packed with rabid moviegoers, and the cast flees the theater as the movie starts uh, to find and uh, starts, uh, and they find their car, which is a hearse, being stripped as they come out, and the fans chase them away as they escape in a cab. This scene doesn't fit in the movie i don't know what this is here did you did you understand this at all all right so i wasn't sure if they'd seen the movie or not because they're late going to the premiere right like uh, eddie and his entourage they're late they go the, the the usher runs out he's like oh they're going fucking nuts in there you better come in and they're hurling things they're freaking going nuts so my impression of it was they maybe saw the movie and thought it was a complete piece of shit, which probably isn't that far from the truth. And they're getting chased out and Kathy jumps in front of a taxi to uh, stop it so they can all get in. But uh, I think the scene's worth it because uh, Martin Landau, Bella Lugosi gets one of my favorite scenes uh, lines in the movie. There's so many good lines and most of them are, are Martin Landau's, but uh <laughs> They, they're all in the taxi. They're all about to drive away. And, and Bella's like, now that's a movie premiere. <laughs> that's true. So <laughs> that was great. And Bela Lugosi, people are starting to pay attention to him again because he's gone to rehab and, you know, he's, he's you know, been in the papers. And so he gives a speech from the movie to the crowd, the, these, these people that are kind of trying to get his autograph and stuff. And uh, that's a really great scene as well because it, it's just spectacular. Anytime Martin Landau in this movie is giving a just a soliloquy, it is just spectacular. But unfortunately, later, Ed, he gets a call and Bela has died. Um, and this is kind of where the movie starts to hit the gas pedal, where, um, you know, Tim Burton was like, oh, shit. I have a lot more story to tell, but I don't have much time to do it. Um, this is kind of where, you know, we start to get montages and stuff happening real quick because we cut yep. right to the we cut right to the funeral. Bela's buried in his Dracula cape, which is hilarious. And and somebody even mentions, like, why was he buried in the cape? And they're like, it was in his will. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ed watches the scene that he filmed with Bela after rehab that we talked about earlier. And uh, then Ed gets a fateful visit from his landlord. He's behind on rent. He's bounced three checks to his landlord. And he's like, oh, let me write you another check. <laughs> and he's digging <laughs> through boxes and shit trying to find his checks. And um, 
And the landlord says that he he's like, oh, you're in the pictures, huh? And he's like, yeah. And he says, well, we, you know, my church and I, we want to make a series of religious films. We have enough money to make one, but we don't have enough to make all of them. So Ed talks him into funding a sci-fi movie, an established genre film, he says, that's sure to make money. And that'll raise the funds for the rest of their religious movies that they can make, right? Um, <laughs> what, so do you think that Ed knows that he's ripping this guy off, or do you think he genuinely believes that he's going to make all this money? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I believe he's ripping them off so he can make the movie, but I also, like, this guy's... Nothing but confidence. I always admire characters in fiction that have way too much confidence, even though they keep failing. And like the my first go tos, they're from my teen years, I guess. I like maybe just think like a Bud Bundy or a Beavis and Butthead, like losers who keep losing but feel like they've got it going on, you know. <laughs> and that's that's Eddie. He's totally different to those guys, obviously. But, uh, yes, he's using them. But I also think he strongly believes that this might, this movie, this movie is about to make, this is the one. This is the one that's going to be his magnum opus that's going to give him, give him and them the notoriety and the cash in order to make these religious flicks. So... Yeah, all of the above. <laughs> That's awful. That's a good explanation. So, uh, you know, Ed casts Vampira, Vampira, and and um, it's funny because she doesn't want any lines in the movie because she doesn't want any to recognize her, but she wears her regular outfit in the fucking movie. So, I mean, obviously people are going <laughs> to recognize her. So, um, and then, and then Kathy is with them and her chiropractor comes in and, and Ed like holds a napkin up to his face because he has to cast a double for Bela Lugosi because he's got the one scene and he wants Bela to be in a couple more scenes. So he needs a double. And this chiropractor guy, who is another character actor you've seen in all kinds of stuff probably, and he kind of holds a napkin up to his face and he's like, oh, my God, it's uncanny. You know, so he cast this guy. Right. And that guy was in a couple more Ed Wood movies, actually, like the real chiropractor dude. So, yeah. Um, showed his face. I, yep. That's pretty awesome. So, uh, you know, let's see here. And, um, okay, and then this scene. Okay, the cast has to get baptized. You can, Take us through this scene, Luke. This is tremendous. <laughs> so you, you just think uh, you've got all these kind of progressive weirdos, you know, and, and they're not weird because they're progressive. They're weird because, like, you just listen to them talk. They're kind of weird people, right? But then you also, like, some of them are uh, trans or uh, gay or uh, transvestites like Ed. And, <laughs> and uh, they're all in some, like, pool getting baptized. Ed, Ed, Eddie does it. And then, like, you see Bunny do it, to, do it as well. And you just think, like, if they knew who, what, what Bunny and... Eddie were like the ch this church would be absolutely fucking mortified right and then the, the funny thing is like Bunny gets baptized and it's obvious that he can't swim he's flailing around until he meets uh, uh, <laughs> Ed Wood at the end and he's like this is, he's like this is the uh, it, it, you must be the only guy who uh, got his cast and crew baptized just to make a movie <laughs> <laughs> and and so the guy you know is baptizing him the the preacher or whatever he's like do you accept jesus christ into your heart and bunny looks at him and goes sure <laughs> that's just spectacular i love that that was great um bill murray is so funny in this movie and 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 what's great is you want more of him but you can't have it you know so it's like that perfect amount of an actor where you want a little more but you know what it's not there so that's fine. You just accept what's there. I love it. So filming commences on Plan 9 from Outer Space. Now, originally it was called Grave Robbers from Outer Space, but the church people keep frustrating Eddie because they want changes, and one of them is Plan 9 from Outer Space instead, which Eddie admits later is a better title, which is funny. Um, but they frustrate him on set, and he has to put on women's clothing to calm down. 
right? So the church, <laughs> the church people lose their fucking minds, and so does Eddie. And it's the, only, it's the only time in the movie that we see him frustrated. You know, we see him really lose his shit, and and he can't, he doesn't know what to do. So he goes to a bar in drag, and he sees Orson Welles played tremendously by Vincent D'Onofrio, who is an amazing actor. And Orson yep. Welles is sitting there. And he goes over and sits by him and says, hey, I'm an I'm a great, you know, they kind of connect about the problems of filmmaking. And once again, Eddie's inspired. <laughs> once again. I, so. I absolutely love this scene because uh, I like I kept waiting for Vincent D'Onofrio to turn up. So I didn't know he, he played Orson Welles when I when I put this movie on. So I'm like, oh, where is he? Where is he? Oh, my God. He's Orson Welles. That's fantastic. Now, I love some love me some awesome Wells flicks. Uh, I haven't seen them all, but all the ones I've watched have been fantastic. But the parallels between Ed Wood and Orson Wells are just uncanny, especially since like Orson Wells, critically acclaimed movie director, and Ed Wood, who makes total bullshit. But they had long periods of their careers where they just couldn't get shit up and running. And, and, uh, yeah, Orson just inspires Ed to be like, fuck you, church people. This is my vision. Get out of here. That's what he does, too, you know. And Orson Welles mentions that the only movie that he had, you know, complete control on was the best movie maybe ever made, which is Citizen Kane. And, and, and another interesting thing about this is if you watch Citizen Kane, um, the – it's Tim Burton is probably maybe the biggest fan of Citizen Kane of anyone ever, because if you look at the settings and the way that like scenes, um, you know, like if you let's say in a Tim Burton movie, you saw a picture of a house on a hill, it would look just like in Citizen Kane. Like, it, I mean, it is dead on like they obviously he was hugely inspired by Citizen Kane, a lot of the Orson Welles movies and stuff like that. But, you know, I'm a big fan of the third man, too. I really like that. I think that was a great movie One of my and favorite movies of all time. It's tremendous. And, you know, I, I think, you know, Orson Welles fucking rules. So it's really fun to see him show up in the movie. Um, and like you said, Eddie just returns to the set, still dressed as a woman and is like, fuck you. This is my movie. Get the hell out of here. And we get a filmmaking montage. We got the fucking gas gas pedal to the metal, just getting through this as quick as we can. And in this this, uh, you know, this film montage has like an old whole Hollywood anthem playing. And it's fucking glorious. I love this. Do you, do you remember anything about the montage or anything that, that we should mention at all? Yeah, I love this too, and I think going to what you said about the like maybe the last half an hour, uh, it made me think like, all right, they want to do two things at the end. They want to celebrate his most famous movie, Plan 9 from Outer Space, but they also want to kind of fit in. I don't want to say cram because I, everything else is so kind of measured and deliberate in this film. But uh, with um, – oh, shit. Uh, Kathy? So pl- yeah, yeah, so they have to kind of fit so they yeah, you want to have some more stuff with Kathy. You also want to have a bit of closure with some of the characters as well, but you can't finish the movie uh, of of Ed Wood without at least like showing a loving kind of montage of kind of one of the best worst movies ever made. Uh, I thought it was I thought it was fantastic, very lovingly lovingly done. Uh, like it there's so many times in this movie where Tim Burton could have just taken a big shit like all over, like, cause he's a, he makes bad movies. And for many years, so many people are just like dismissed Ed Wood and kind of shit on him. So I, I think I, I really prefer this approach, which is more of a, a, a loving kind of homage to, I guess I'd call him a trailblazer because you, there's a lot of people making really bad movies now and they, they're kind of tuning them out mostly because like social media and the internet kind of a, and you know, smartphones and technology and shit makes it so much fucking easier to make movies. But uh, yeah, uh, as for things in the montage itself, uh, if you've seen, if plan nine is pretty fresh in your brain, 
which it wasn't for me. Uh, I decided to watch Glenn or Glenda instead. Uh, I think I think they recreate it really, really well. In fact, I think it actually looks better than the actual movie. It itself. does, definitely does. Yes, especially the scene with um with George the Animal Steel raising up out of the grave, and the two cops have to come over and help him out. You know, like that, that looks amazing. You know, it's it's really great. Um, you know, and and something you mentioned a second ago, and the term I think you're looking for is that this movie had to have a Hollywood ending. It had to. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is a Hollywood movie made about Hollywood, a different part of Hollywood that you haven't really learned about and you don't know much about. And so we have to have this Hollywood ending. So that's what we get. Um, after the montage, it starts raining as Ed and Kathy arrive at the premiere late. This guy's got a big problem with showing up to premieres late. Um, <laughs> so, And he receives an ovation. And we see the final scene that Bela filmed. And as that happens, they leave. The crowd's happy. Ed proposes to Kathy in the rain, and we see his eternal optimism because it's ra- they open the door to the car because they can't get the the like cover up on top of the car, and it's just there's like a, a giant puddle just comes right out of the, wa- of the car, and he's like, let's drive to Vegas right now, and elope. And she says, well, it's raining and we don't have a top on the car. And he says, he says, it'll stop by the time we get there. <laughs> so, and it's the we, desert. It won't be raining. It's just amazing, man. And so then we get text about each of the characters future as credits roll. This movie is fucking spectacular. I love it so much. I know it's tangent, tangentially related to wrestling, but I mean, we were originally going to review the CM Punk uh, horror movie that's on Netflix. Wasn't this much better? Well, I'm going to be totally truthful. I was pretty busy the, like the last couple of weeks, and you suggested we watch the CM Punk flick. And I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. I'll do that. And I just got so busy I hadn't quite got around to it yet because we had to uh, reschedule at least twice, right, because of both – you know, we got shit going on. And uh, when you suggested instead that we watch Ed Wood, I was like, fuck that CM Punk movie. I'm just going to watch Ed Wood. And I will say <laughs> it might be tangentially about wrestling, but uh, Georgie Animal Steel is in this movie a lot. He, he doesn't have cameos. He he's, It's not a cameo. He's not in a couple scenes and he's gone. Sure, he doesn't have that much dialogue, but uh, he is in quite a lot of scenes either in the in the front or the background uh and so i i i, uh, I would much rather of what look i don't even i'm not even aware, like aware that much of his career as i am with say cm punks but um i don't think going by what you uh, messaged me about the cm punk movie uh i don't think we would have talked for anywhere near as long either so uh you know <laughs> well, you know, like I said, I, you know, obviously I don't even think we have to ask each other, but obviously I say we both recommend this movie. Um, if you've never seen this, I, it's spectacular. Highly recommend Citizen Kane as well and The Third Man. Other movies I'd recommend that are not you know, or not necessarily similar to this, but are kind of the same thing is, uh, you know, would be any of these early Tim Burton movies. I mean, you know, Beetlejuice, like you said, uh, you know, uh, what, what's the, you know, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. There's also another movie I'd recommend from early in um, Johnny Depp's career called Dead Man. Uh, that's also in um, black and white. And it is a tremendous movie. It's not it's not directed by Tim Burton, but it's awesome. Is that Jim Jamoosh? What's that? I think that was Jim Jarmusch. I'm not 100 percent on that. It could be. It's a movie where this Native American character kind of mistakes him for the famous writer Walt Whitman, I think. And like, yeah. or maybe maybe it's a different writer, but it's a very good movie and it's very funny in a lot of the same ways. So it, it's it's good stuff. But uh, but anyway, well, anything else you want to say about this movie or anything else you want to get out there other than tell people where folks can find you, Luke? Um. The movie, like, if you don't know anything about Ed Wood and, or if you don't care about watching So Bad That They're Good movies, that doesn't matter. Uh, everything you want and need is in Ed Wood. <clears throat> I think it's a, a celebration of kind of <laughs> guerrilla filmmaking and just, like, 
um, and also just also a celebration of kind of being who you are and and uh, and sticking to that, especially in a time when this movie set in the 50s where uh, a lot of this shit was very frowned upon. Like they might might have been able to get away with it because in in those days they're in um, Los Angeles and Los Angeles is always at least to me, struck me as a very liberal place where people like this can kind of be uh, accepted and be who they are. Uh, I think that's a, a really good positive message, and I think that's a message that carries over if you watch the – and look, this is not me – like, the movie's shit, but Glenn or Glenda really does have this amazingly positive message about all that kind of stuff, and for a – as a as a kind of maybe a like a time capsule piece, like I think in that respect it's worth looking at. Otherwise, uh, everything you need is pretty much in uh, Ed Wood that you might want to see. So uh, I, I know a lot of a lot of people can stomach so bad it's good. I can, uh, but you know a lot of people can't. As for me, um, I'm on YouTube. LSJ reviews. Uh, yeah kind of ripped that off from Zack Sabre Jr., I guess, but my name's Luke Sims Jenkins, so it, it, it fits. Uh, I'm After we're done here, uh, I'm going to do a review uh, of Ed Wood, which is by no means going to be as in-depth as this. So uh, in my video, I'm going to pop a link to uh, this podcast and go, hey, there's too much shit to talk about with this movie. Uh, come check it out here. But, yeah, LSJ's reviews on YouTube. Uh, I'm kind of sticking to older films at the moment just because uh, it's cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> bit of, bit of uh, something under the curtain here. I, like, it's easy for me to watch something I'm half interested in if all i got to do is load up the DVD player or find a, a stream of it on Netflix and just, like, let it go than it is for me to go – Oh fuck! I've got to put twenty bucks down on this movie. I'm only half interested in. Oh fuck! I feel I feel sorry for this movie because I'm probably going to be like, I paid money for this. How dare you? So I think going forward, there is definitely going to be me doing current movies. Uh, my, I think my next current movie is going to be Mark Wahlberg's new Netflix movie because yeah, hey, it's new and it's free. Woohoo! Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, apart from that, I'm probably going to stick to. Uh, what I call the late reviews. Uh, they're late because I'm, re- I'm reviewing them well after they got released. So that's uh, that's pretty much where I'm at in terms of uh, what I'm doing, yeah. And I'm on Twitter. So uh, Grumpy2, uh, the number two, EB. That's where I'm at. Well, you know, the cool thing about your YouTube channel is you can do whatever the fuck you want with it. So, you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah, late late reviews, on-time reviews, they're all reviews, and I really enjoy them. I think they're fun. They're also very short, which is uh, much appreciated because uh, I am – so bad at going on and on and on. But, uh, you know, I, I hope you guys enjoyed listening to this. Check out Ed Wood. You can follow me on Twitter, Drusifer Tweets. You can follow our show at The Road Home FW for, for me, LSJ, uh, and, uh, you know, my guest today, and Ed Wood. Thank you so much for listening.